Of all nature's gifts to man, good health is the most precious. All over the world, medical science is constantly searching for ways of overcoming the many ailments that endanger it. Some diseases, once deadly, have been beaten. But there are others that still make inroads on happiness and efficiency. One of the most vicious of these as yet untamed disease germs is that which causes consumption, or tuberculosis. It has been one of man's chief scourges throughout the ages. Medicine recognizes two distinct forms of the disease. Pulmonary, where the chest is affected, and non-pulmonary, which affects glands, bones, and parts of the body other than the chest. Of the two, the chest disease is the more prevalent, the more serious. It's infectious, man infects man. The disease was known in ancient Greece more than 2,000 years ago, but its ravages are not limited to any one country or race. It's a worldwide problem the magnitude of which can be judged by figures. Expert estimates for the year 1935 say that of the world's population, more than two million people died of TB. In England and Wales, of that two million, only 24,603 were recorded. Improvements in general standards of living and better housing have in part been responsible for the gradual decrease in TB deaths in Britain during this century. In 1910, deaths were about 40,000. And apart from a sharp rise during the war years 1914-1918, the figures have steadily improved. In World War II, there was again a rise, but it was controlled, and by 1943, deaths were less than 22,000. Early treatment is of supreme importance, but diagnosis isn't easy. In its early stages, the disease doesn't readily reveal itself. A cough, some lassitude, well, who doesn't suffer from these at some time? But they may be telltale signs. If TB is suspected, X-ray will confirm or disprove. And with the introduction of mass miniature radiography, which provides a much cheaper, faster and wider X-ray service, medicine has made a great stride towards the goal of early diagnosis. This is the x-ray of a normally healthy person. You see the outline of neck and shoulders. The lungs lying under the ribs, each side of the chest, are clear and unmarked. And here we see the effects of the disease. A large cavity on the right and scattered disease everywhere. This is how it may spread if untreated. Where diagnosis is confirmed by sputum examination, the next thing is to get the patient away so that he won't be infectious to others and will, under medical care, make progress towards recovery. Wherever the patient is sent, an all-important feature of treatment will be rest. Rest with good food and fresh air. This sanatorium at Milford, maintained by the Surrey County Council, is just one of the 370 throughout Britain. 370 sanatoria where modern treatment is available. In such places, medical and sometimes surgical treatment, coupled with the essentials named, good food, fresh air and rest, does much to arrest the progress of the disease. If taken early, treatment may restore the patient to health. But what of the sufferer not discovered until the disease has passed the early stages? Consider the ordinary working man earning his living in the stress and rush of everyday life. In some cases, the ex-sanatorium patient returns to his old job without any ill effect. He won't have been discharged until the disease is quiescent. But should his job demand stamina and abundance of energy, as most ordinary jobs do, his impaired strength may not be enough to prevent a relapse.
when unemployment, disillusion and a return to the sanatorium are inevitable. What are the prospects for such people? How is such a man to earn his living, perhaps support a family? In 1941, a man who had lived to see his vision become a successful reality died. Sir Pendrell Valier Jones, one time tuberculosis officer for Cambridgeshire, recognized this tragedy for the individual. In 1915, in this cottage in its garden in the village of Bourne, Valier Jones, with a handful of patients, started to put his ideas into practice, to provide purposeful work as an adjunct to medical treatment. In 1918, Papworth Hall was acquired. Here, in pleasant wooded surroundings, Varia Jones and 25 sufferers settled down. The hall and a few cottages were the only buildings. Today, the hall, originally the hospital, is the administrative nerve center of a thriving, contented community. As the experiment proved its merits, Varia Jones found the money to expand. Papworth has grown rapidly in its 26 years. There are hospitals for the ill, Chalets for the recovering. There are hostels. There are cottages where a man may bring his family to settle. And there are factories. Factories at the moment producing for war. The unfit, the disabled pulling their weight in the fight for freedom, where in other circumstances they might have been a handicap to the nation's effort. Take the case of a typical Packworth villager, Frank Thompson. This is his story. Frank was a sailor. When TB was diagnosed, he was discharged. His career finished. He was sent to a sanatorium and after treatment took a job as a dock laborer. A relapse followed and further treatment. His hopes of ultimately regaining a normal life had faded. Then Papworth was suggested and sent by his local authority, he arrived at the settlement in September 1936, where he was taken to hospital for rest and observation. Like all patients on arrival, he spent a period in bed with treatment suited to his individual condition. For him and his ward mates, for all, rest, complete rest, is at first essential. In the hospitals, there are men and women from all classes of society, from many races. Days, weeks, months of idleness are irksome to once active people. So in Papworth, as in other sanatoria, occupational therapy is encouraged. Medical treatment varies. In Thompson's case, artificial pneumothorax of the left lung was prescribed. This is relatively simple and is used in cases where only one lung is diseased. The chest wall is punctured, and air in controlled amounts is let in, so compressing the affected lung. The lung is in this way kept idle and has an opportunity to heal. The benefits of general rest are supplemented by the rest enforced on the diseased lung by the pressure of air. In other cases, treatment may involve less simple operations. For these, Papworth has its own surgical block with operating theatre. Thompson progressed to convalescence, from bed to light exercise, from hospital to sanatorium. At this stage, he was allotted a chalet. Here he lived for 14 months. Adjustable flaps on each side allow a maximum fresh air, but offer protection against bad weather. Strict medical supervision continues, but from now on the prospect of work begins to assume importance. What work can such a man do? 
work within his limited powers. Work that won't cause further relapse. Handicrafts, fine as a help in passing the time, solve the problem for the few. Only the few could earn a living by such means. Open air work, again, fine, if it never entailed heavy and tiring jobs. And remember, the majority of patients are townspeople who have no feeling for such work, even if it could be found. Papworth offers employment such as a fit person would expect. In factories and workshops where machinery has been introduced to the maximum extent, so that there may be the minimum risk of relapse through overstrain. Before any patient begins work, he is given a thorough overhaul in an attempt to assess his capabilities and powers of resistance. In this test, Thompson's breathing is studied. He wears a mask, and as he breathes, gently or deeply, the movement is plotted on a rotating drum. On this strange-looking bicycle, Thompson works against a known resistance. He pedals at a steady rate set by a metronome. Again, he wears a mask, and this time the breath he exhales is collected in a bag, later to be examined for carbon dioxide content. From these tests, coupled with the known clinical and x-ray details, his progress is assessed. Thompson's file contains full details. He has reached the stage where he can start in one of the factories. At a meeting of the personnel panel, the medical staff state the patient's limitations. Thompson, light work, two hours a day only for the moment, a standing job suitable. And it's up to the industrial chiefs to find him a berth. Thompson, the ex-sailor, in 1937, became a learner in the leather workshop. A two-hour-a-day learner has become a skilled craftsman, working full-time at trade union rates. In these factories, we see the full fruition of Varia Jones's theories. He sought to end the system where patients went straight from sanatoria, either to unemployment with all its worries, or to unsuitable work with all its strain. The recovering patient needed hope, as well as medical treatment. Hope, not for charity, but for work. Work for wages. Wages enough to buy the essential nourishing food. Papworth's industries, travelling goods, printing, cabinet making, employ its patients and ex-patients. In war, to obtain maximum output from its plant, Papworth employed fit workers alongside the disabled. In peacetime, almost all employees, from learner to general manager, are patients or ex-patients. Their products are sold in the open market and rank with the finest in the country. Thompson started work, he was living in the chalets and working only two hours a day. As his medical condition improved, his hours of work increased and he moved from the chalet to one of the hostels. Here, men have their own individual rooms with communal feeding and recreation facilities. enthusiasts for every type of indoor sport, and the organization of various clubs is one of the jobs of committees elected from settlers and patients.
For married men, there are cottages in the village. Cottages where they may settle and bring their wives and families. Twenty months from the day he entered Patworth's Bernard Barron Hospital, Thompson was accepted as a cottage tenant. His home, broken up by his illness, was established again. His self-respect was regained with his earning power. He has a full-time job and, reunited with his family, leads a normal life like millions of fit men all over the country. He lives in a village which has little to distinguish it from any other English community. Lies on a main road and probably not 10% of people passing through know what Papworth really is. There's a church and chapels, a school, a village store. And when the day's work is over, there's entertainment on one of the best stages in Cambridgeshire, where visiting companies play to a highly enthusiastic audience of villagers and servicemen from neighbouring camps. Tonight, it's one act plays with a wartime all-women cast. Tomorrow, it may be a film show, a whist drive, a dance, or the Papworth player's own pantomime. But whatever it may be, those who cannot leave their beds are not forgotten. Men and women who will gradually be rehabilitated like the Frank Thompsons of the settlement. For many of them, a few weeks or months ago, the future held nothing better than alternating improvements and relapses, fear of loss of employment and risk of financial ruin. This patient discusses her future with her nurse. And this very nurse herself first saw Papworth as a patient. She was restored to health and rehabilitated in the settlement. She has a private room in the Queen Mary house, one of the 40 nurses, all TB sufferers who live there. Their work, service to fellow sufferers, is planned in short spells of duty in the hospitals. And in their own home, they have ample facilities for recreation or relaxation. All settlers, whether their work is nursing or machine minding, have a double assurance that helps to keep them fit. A regular pay packet for a job well done and the knowledge that if they break down, they can be treated in Papworth, and that the same employment waits for them when they are fit to return to work. Thompson, in 1936, considered himself a has-been. There was no future to hope for. Now he has a job, a home, and most vital of all to a family man, his children are healthy. His two eldest, who came to Papworth as youngsters, have left the village sturdy young men as fit as any in the nation. We said earlier that Frank Thompson lived in an ordinary village. But one feature distinguishes it from the ordinary. The constant medical care available, and indeed enforced on the villagers and their families. The weekly children's clinic is only one example of the routine. For patients and settlers, there's the regular X-ray checkup, as well as all normal medical attention. For the children, the health service is magnificent. Fit and healthy children born in a village where no healthy person may settle. If their parents had never come to Papworth, many of these children would have been reared in the very surroundings and conditions that foster the disease. In these youngsters, we have the finest results of a courageous enterprise. Mm -hmm.